What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show, the home of Epic Conversations, and I'm the host of Epic Conversations. I am. I was the 2020 Podcast News and 2018 Innovation Award winner given out by the Canadian Ethnic Media Association. And also, once a month, I host the only... I know podcast show, online show, don't know what to call it, <laughs> that are for fathers and men around the world that is sponsored by Dove Men Care. And it's also co-sponsored by Dad Central, Canada's national fatherhood organization. And as always, I'd like to say you're blessed, highly favored, a magnet for miracles and a solution for someone's problem. If you know anything about Dr. Vibe, I love meeting new, incredible people. And uh, through a platform, called Clubhouse that I'm sure some people have or some people haven't heard about, I have met another outstanding person. And you know what was even better? She's going to be here with us today. But let me give a little background on our special friend today. Angel B. Hartwell, known as the Wealthy Life Mentor, is an internationally known artist, author, and evolutional, evolutionary sorry, alchemist. Honored to be the change movement to watch award winner and considered one of America's premier experts. She has appeared multiple times in the major media and is a creator, executive producer, and host of the 2020 People's Choice Award winning and Apple number one internationally ranked Wickedly Smart Women podcast. Love the name because I know some wickedly smart women and this is one of them right now that I've just met. And it's hired to consult with high achieving leaders who are called to be the vanguard of the creative age. Got to ask how she came up with that one because I like that one too. She is a giver, wickedly smart, but most importantly, she has an incredible heart. So we are blessed and very highly favored today to have Angel with us. Angel, how are you? I'm filled with fabulosity, Dr. Vibe. I'm so excited <laughs> to be here. <laughs> You're a wordsmith. I am. Me and words are friends. Absolutely. Well, I really have to say thank you for taking the time to share with us today because I've been blessed to be part of some of your epic conversations, all your epic conversations on Clubhouse. And I just said to myself, you know what? I'd like to have this lady share with us. And you said yes. Of course I did, because you're awesome. You're Dr. Vibe. Dude, <laughs> it anybody was, who calls himself Dr. Vibe, I'm like, yes, I'm a yes to you. You know, it was so cool, because the first time I came into the club, you said, Dr. Vibe. Like, yeah, you just said, there was curiosity right from the get-go. And I said, all right, let's go. And um, please, we're going to put up Angel's contact information throughout the conversation. Follow her. Now, don't sh she just wisdom, evaluate experience, but she comes with the right intent and the right heart. So I'm endorsing her. So, hey, if you don't want to follow her, that's your fault and not my fault, but she is a wonderful lady. So Angel, as always, when we have new friends on the Dr. Vibe show, um, give us a little background where you grew up, life growing up, the younger Angel. All right. Well, before I do that, I'm going to have to say, I got to tell my team they need to add endorsed by Dr. Vibe to yes. my bio. <laughs> no, I, no, absolutely. I'm no. like stoked now. I've been endorsed by Dr. Absolutely. Vibe. It's oh. all good. I, I, hey, I'll, if you want, I'll even do a little 30 minute vid, second video for you. Yeah, I'm down for that. All well, right. Let's talk about uh, who I once was back in the day. So I grew up in the Merrimack Valley of New Hampshire. And I still live in the Merrimack Valley of New Hampshire. I literally was born in the city that I am living in right now, um, but I grew up in the next town over. And it was a farm town. So I, I would wake up in the summertime with the smell of cow poop and, you know, floating through my window. <laughs> so I'm pretty well grounded in nature and, um, you know, the natural world. And I love living here because it is, you know, it's just so beautiful here. But I, I do remember when I was little not liking it here and feeling very, um, you know, just feeling like I needed to connect with the bigger world sure. and that it was too small of a space for me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess uh, I don't, I'm just not really sure exactly where you want me to go with this, but um, I'll tell you when I was little, my what I wanted to be when I grew up was a heart surgeon. Oh, and I have come to the place now where I am, in some ways, a heart surgeon. 
I am in some ways a heart surgeon. I'm, I'm, I don't have blood all over my hands, no. but instead I support people to actually, you know, a lot of people call it mindset. I yes. call it heart set, right? I love so that. I help people to, to bring into reality what they have their heart set on creating. Nice. So when you wanted to be a heart surgeon, how long did that dream last for? I remember that I was nine years old when I made that decision. I was nine years old that I wanted to be a heart surgeon. And I, I got that um, clarity through reading. I, so my dad was a reader and he used to, um, uh, he used to have the uh, subscription to the Reader's Digest. And back then, every month, there was a, a section of the Reader's Digest that talked about uh, organs, people's organs, right? And it was called I am Joe's. So I am Joe's kidney. I am Joe's brain. I am Joe's uh, spleen. And I am Joe's heart. I read I am Joe's heart. And I was like, oh, I want to be a heart surgeon. And uh, I carried that for a while. And then I kind of tucked it away. And when I graduated from high school, uh, I actually graduated a year early. And so when I graduated, oh, which makes me wickedly smart, I guess, <laughs> uh, I graduated a year early. And um, when I graduated, I wanted at that point to be a pharmacist. I had decided I wanted to be a pharmacist. Like anatomy and physiology was my favorite subject. I really loved anatomy and physiology. And so I ended up going to college, but my dad lost his job oh. two weeks before I graduated from high school. Yeah, And so I had one year and my major um, in at Penn State was biochemistry. I had one year and then I had to leave because um, my dad had made too much money in the previous year, the year that he lost his job yeah. to qualify for any of the like uh, grants or sure. loans or whatever at the time. Yep. But by the time, you know, I got around to actually needing money from him, he couldn't provide the money because he had uh, invested in a piece of real estate that ended up being a hazardous waste dump, unfortunately. Oh my God. Yeah. So it's just like, a, a, it, and my, you know, so my track went in a different direction. My track went in a different direction and I just started working and, and became, um, you know, I, I worked as a waitress. I worked uh, uh, in the drilling and blasting. I worked for a drilling and blasting company. I did. Uh, are, there, are there pictures of that? <laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> there might be somewhere buried in a box somewhere. Yeah, I, I worked in construction. I worked for a paving company. I mean, I just did a lot of different things. And I did a lot. I did a lot in um, like bookkeeping. My mom taught me how to bookkeep when I was seven years old. She had a yarn shop in our house. So I was like learning how to do debits and credits when I was seven or eight years old. And I was learning how to ask for money. Dr. Vibe, I was learning how to ask for money when I was seven, right? Wow. Yeah. When I was nine, I sold 763 boxes of Girl Scout cookies when I was nine years old by knocking on doors and, and calling people. And the next nearest girl sold like 27 boxes. So I've been an overachiever for a while. So you're you're reading my alleged mind because I was going to ask, where did the business acumen start? Yeah. And it well, my, started at a young age. Yeah, very young. My mom had a yarn shop in our house. Um, and so the little ladies from the town would come in and buy yarn. And I was in charge of the cash box, right? So I was like, here's the yarn. Give me the cash. I was answering the phone. You know, my mom had had uh, a lot of aspirations for herself. And um, my dad, he was in sales. My dad was a car salesman. And so, you know, I think from both sides, my mom and my dad, the business stuff and my mom and he had met in the car business. She was a bookkeeper in a dealership and he came into that dealership to do a trade um, and she saw his shoulders. That's the story. <laughs> <laughs> he saw his shoulders. All right. So Penn State didn't happen. I went for a year. I went for a year to Penn State, lived with my half sister. And then when I came out of that year, the, the finances weren't there. So I went to work. I went to work and I worked from, uh, you know, 18, 19 years old until I was about 27 when I ended up in my first marriage. And my first husband, uh, we had a lot of challenges with one another, but there there is a, a couple blessings. One was my son. My son was a blessing out of that. But another blessing is, is he like actually challenged me to go back to school and get my degree. So 
I ended up going back to school and I graduated summa cum laude like five months after my son was born uh, with a degree in business wow. management. And I went, wow. to night I went to night school. So, yeah. And, and he and I were both going to school together. So we graduated together. Uh, he and I graduated together and we had our baby was like, I don't know, five or six months old when we finally graduated. So, yeah. You and are then, the you are an overachiever. Yeah. And by then I was also in the real estate business. So that at that point I was in the real estate business and I was uh, working with a partner and we were doing uh, management, real estate management. And I spent 20 years in the real estate business. So what, yeah. what, what did you learn from the real estate business that you're still carrying on today? Well, um, so the first thing I learned in the real estate business that I'm still carrying on today is that everything needs a blueprint and a foundation, right? And so if you're called to be a messenger and if you're called to serve people in the world uh, the way you and I do right now, which is basically we're converting our wisdom into wealth. We're serving by, you know, sharing our messages and by speaking our vision and motivating people and those sorts of things. Even a business that is as nebulous as that, right, where we're literally taking ideas out of the, the blue and turning them into something that people can offer, even those things need a foundation and they need a blueprint. And so, um, how I like to work with people when I'm serving them is I like to start with, do you have a blueprint? Do you have the strategy for how you're going to create the business and the model and the structure for your business that's going to allow you to have the lifestyle that you want? Because for me, having, having a lifestyle business is really important. It's been very important since I left the real estate industry. It became very important for me to have a have a lifestyle business. So first we look at what's the lifestyle that you want to have, right? And um, and then, well, what's the blueprint to build the business that's going to serve your lifestyle so that you can feel full to overflowing while you're serving in your business, right? So we want to make sure that we structure things properly so that uh, so that as a messenger, you're coming from your overflow. You're serving from your saucer, not your cup. So that's the first thing is making sure you have the blueprint. And then the foundation, well, you know, the basic foundation of any business, any business, I don't care whether it's selling cars or selling yarn in the yarn shop or uh, selling services, any business you need to have real clarity in what you're offering, the value of what that offer is the capacity to communicate the value of that offer in a way that allows the people who are listening to you to say, oh, that person gets me. They know what I'm looking for and they seem credible and capable of being able to deliver. And, and then from there, having the capacity to have the selling conversation. And business is pretty simple. You know, it's basically, you know, have something to offer. Communicate that you have that thing to offer, make that offer, make the deal, serve the person beautifully. Like we want to serve the people beautifully so that they actually are able to succeed. And then we just, you know, take and um, work on the momentum of the success of our clients to generate more clients. And, and it's pretty simple. Like business is really simple. That's all you have to do. So you're, you're dropping knowledge bombs, as we say on the Dr. Vibe show, but if it's so simple, why is it so tough for so many of us? Great question. Well, there's, there's a few reasons why. Let me see which way I want to go with this. So I want to talk to people who are called. Anybody okay. who's called, and this was my experience, when I left real estate, it was because I had a spiritual awakening. And as a result of that spiritual awakening, I was really called to serve people and to let people know that they didn't have to be in suffering, right? That they, there was a way out, right? And a lot of times people who are called, so I came from the real estate industry. Right. I didn't know crap about how to set up my own consulting business. I didn't know crap about that. I knew nothing about it. Right. But the calling was so powerful 
that I simply served until I got empty because I, I couldn't not do it, right? So I didn't know that I actually needed to set up structures that allow me to receive in exchange for what I was delivering in a way that was, um, you know, mutually beneficial. Yep. So, so number one, people who are called often are so compelled that they're literally throwing spaghetti against the wall or what we call spraying and praying. So they're spraying out their message and it's literally like throwing water into the desert. You can sprinkle water into the desert and all of a sudden something will blossom. But as soon as the storm is over, or the, the water that you've sprinkled into the desert has moved past the desert, everything dries up again. And so anybody who's called to be a messenger, they have this like, they, they must share their message, but they don't necessarily know how to deliver it in a way that allows people to, to take the next step, to understand this is just a tiny, 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 it seems like a lot. It seems like I'm giving a lot today, right? But it's barely scratching the surface of how I can serve and support people. So that's number one. Number one is, you know, knowing or they don't know. They don't know that what they don't know. They don't know that they actually need to have a clearer structure for monetization. The second thing is oftentimes people come out of like quitting the corner office, right? They like I did. I came out of the real estate industry into uh, the expert, right, messenger industry, uh, personal professional development industry. I came out of real estate and into this, and so. I didn't know how to have the one-on-one -on -one or the one-to-many sales conversation in, this, in the way that would allow people to convert into clients, from prospects into clients. I just didn't know what I didn't know. I knew how to you know, show somebody a house, right? I knew how to sell Girl Scout cookies. Selling a product is different than selling a service, and it requires a different structure. And again, we're going to use that word structure. So those are two reasons why uh, to answer your question. That's fantastic. Um, you, so you you got you left the real estate and eventually got into podcasting, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's interesting because you have shaken my thought process in a good way. Because when I first got into podcasting, I didn't think about monetary, but now. You, whenever I hear you share, when people say, when should I think about making money in podcasting? You say right from the get go. Yeah. Before you even start. Well, yeah. And, and, and you've, and you are living proof. So I'd like you to share your living proof story of how you made money rather quick in a podcast. Yeah. Well, and so part of it, Dr. Vibe is I had already been in a business structure. I had a business model where um, I had structured it to serve my life. So that was step one. I love to spend the summer outside and not working, right? So my life is 12 weeks off in the summer, right? Wow. I'm an artist. I'm an artist. I spend time painting. I'm very spiritual. I spend time yeah. in ceremony and ritual. So I needed to set up a business model and a business structure where the value that I deliver can be delivered at a very high level of investment and in a in the minimum amount of time required to that value. So my model is either one to one or one to small. And I, I don't have a huge structure of you know, 27 different platforms of places where I have to show up and do my study and all these, like, it's very simple. You want to really requires craftsmanship, right? There's a lot of what it is that you are creating. And at the beginning, at the set of that, be, you must be. And you must make sure that you have covered your, what a friend of mine, her name is Allie Kells, your minimum to thrive. Because when you do the math, how I got into podcast, I had clarity on my map. I already had clarity, I already had credit in the market because I'd been doing 
uh, virtual speech since 2008. I was a single mom to the virtual space when I came into the personal professional. I to, and I no way I was going to learn 63 days of the year on the road. Kid up. It was my responsibility. I was coming to being a for the um, ball team after every game. I was the mom where all the kids came to my house after school because I was there, right? I was the mom that kids were coming and they were they were confiding me or asking me for guidance. It set up a model, it allowed me to pay the mortgage on a well, it was a two hundred fifty thousand dollar mortgage, four hundred fifty thousand, and me to sure that my kid had new sneakers because puberty he needed new sneakers three weeks. It was cray cray. So you know, into podcasting. So when our show called the Men's Pod, and when I started my show, I already had crafted a very clear offer for how I was going to work with the men who I knew were going to become my guests and were going to ultimately become my clients. And, and I have your payday, what I call it. I have my five-figure payday podcast. I have my five-figure payday within four months of launching the show. Wow. So, and unfortunately we had some Wi-Fi challenges, but I'm going to, we'll work through that. Why pick a men's show? <laughs> that's where I want, where did that idea come from? Cause I know on in clubhouse, you talked about this story, but I want to know what thought process said, I want to pick a men's show to do. Yeah. So after my spiritual awakening in 2001, I started living my life under the GBS system, which means guided spirit. <laughs> So everything I do in my life is guided by spirit. Right. So what happened was between 2008 and 2016, I generated multiple millions of dollars from home as a single mom. Wow. At the same time, my son was going down the heroin hole. Well, I'm sorry to hear about this. And it was seven long years of, absolute horror it was heroin it was every drug that you can imagine and some that you don't even know exist so i was like in that place you know want to be this kind of super mom right i'm after the team you know and and my is going deeper and deeper and deeper in the hole my uh, my revenue generation and he was the lowest I've ever been, uh, having been arrested a couple times, having gone to rehab. Wow. And as 2016 dawned, within the first four months of 2016, uh, we ended up having what I call now the life rupture. And the life rupture uh, resulted in him actually locking me in the basement and telling me he was going to cut me up in little pieces and throw me in the river when he was high on, uh, I found out later what he was high on. He was high on benzos and fentanyl. And the reason why he went crazy that night was because I finally confronted him because I found that he had been ordering heroin and fentanyl online on my computer system using Bitcoin. And so thankfully, because I live a life guided by spirit, uh, there was a moment where he left the room and went upstairs to use the bathroom and I was able to escape. I heard go now loud and clear. You know, I heard clear as clear as you and I are talking, go now. So I went and I left uh, the house and escaped to the forest. And it's so mythic. It's like not even, it's, it's almost unbelievably, you know, what happened, it was almost unbelievable. But what ended up happening was literally the guy who came and got me out of the forest was Officer Friend. I mean, you can't make Officer Friend came to get me out of the forest. Um, what ended up happening after that was my son went to jail, you know, all the things. Um, he's, he's very well now, let me be clear. And it was a rite of passage for both of us. It was a rite of passage for him out of childhood and into manhood. And it was a rite of passage for me out of motherhood and into elderhood. And so thankfully I have 
you know, a deep spiritual practice that allowed me to be in it, but not of it. Yep. In it, but not of it. And what ended up happening after that was um, my business completely collapsed over the course of the next year until in uh, February of 2017, I made $7, $7 that month in my business. And that at that point, I knew I needed to surrender everything, right? I just had to surrender everything. And so I surrendered. I put my business in the fire in, um, in the early March of 2017. I put my business in the fire and I sat for 10 days and I said, okay, I'm open. I'm open to receiving what's next. And I ended up uh, being selected during that period of time for a new show to be a case study on a show called Fix My Brand. And the woman who selected me, we had had a, an ex a, a relationship from 2010. So now it's seven years later. We knew one yep. another from 2010. She selected me to be on her show. We rebranded my whole thing. And in that rebranding process, that was when the message came through that I was now supposed to serve men. So up until that time, I was serving mostly women and a few very wise men to help them feel great speaking and powerful asking for money. And I had clients all over the world, you know, multiple millions of dollars. And so then it became very clear I needed to serve men. And out of that rebranding process, the at, at first we were going to do a TV show. And then I was like, yeah, no, the, the men I'm supposed to serve are not listening. I mean, watching Internet TV. These, these are people that are not in that space. And then the idea for the podcast came in and it was divinely inspired. And so I said, mm -hmm. yes. So I said, yes, I'll do a podcast called Men on Purpose. And part of what happened, Dr. Vibe, was I became clear during that period that I had spent my entire life in relationships with men because, you know, backstory on my childhood, my dad was a raging alcoholic and very physically abusive. I had spent my entire lifetime in relationships with men who were either addicted, uh, I felt alienated from, they were abusive. Um, and so, you know, I was the single unit thread in all of those relationships, including the one with my son. I was the single unifying thread in all of those relationships. The first husband, the second husband, the bad boyfriends, the cop who was my boyfriend and put a gun in my face, you know, all the things, all the things. They were either abusive, did, or I felt alienated from them. And so the Men on Purpose podcast was launched out of that. Yes, yes. And then I did 163 episodes and it, the whole thing was a healing. The entire podcast experience of those 163 episodes including selling the podcast uh, last spring. I sold the podcast uh, because I had started Weekly Smart Women the fall before, and I got two was too many at that point. Um, so I sold, sold men on purpose in, in the spring of 2020. And it was, a huge, the whole thing was a healing for me. That, that is a phenomenal story. Thank you for the, uh, being make be, feel like you're in a brave and safe space to share that that is phenomenal Th thank you for doing yeah. that like we could end everything just now I i'm good i'm good <laughs> like i mean uh that uh yeah i i think if if you ever write a book overcomer should be the title maybe we'll see we'll see i've got the books inside me dr Bye -bye. I have yeah. Books inside me. yeah i could imagine that uh do you miss not doing the Men on Purpose podcast? That's an excellent question. Um, so I'm hyper creative. I can hyper tell. Creative. Hyper creative, <laughs> right? So at at the point, so let me go back. In December of 2019, in September of 2019, I launched Wicked Be Smart Women. Right. Uh, I had a five-figure payday from that podcast before I even launched, which was awesome. So I I did Wickedly Smart Women September, October, November. In by December, I was 
I this is too much. I need to not be splitting myself between these two shows. And I made the decision to go on hiatus with men on okay. purpose. I thought, okay, I think I'll just take this on hiatus. By then I had a bank, I had a bank of interviews that was going through April. So I said, I'm just gonna put it on hiatus. And then um and then in like I always get ideas in January and May. <laughs> So in January of that year, I had the idea to do a third podcast. So now I have We Do Smart Women, Men on Purpose is running. Oh, my. Third podcast oh, my. Like, oh, oh, my. Another one. Yeah. And so, so what I like to do is I, I like to, because I am hyper creative and I've learned how to rein that in a little bit because um, I could just, you know, spread myself like water in the desert instead of being like, the, the person at the well who is providing a ladle in exchange for <laughs> in exchange. Right. Um, so I was going to do this third podcast. And then I said, well, I'm not going to launch that until I'm clear what I'm doing with men on purpose. And then Corona came. And so the third podcast would have been a, a show that was both men and women. Yeah. And so would I want to do men on purpose again? Um, if the guy who is doing it right now fell apart and, uh, and it became clear that it was time for me to step back in again, I would do it, but I would definitely want to be, uh, you know, rethinking my own business model and making sure that that puzzle piece fit in properly in service to the bigger, uh, vision that's being, yeah. being brought to me. And again, I'll say I'm guided by spirit. So if yep. Spirit said to me tomorrow, start another podcast and be interviewing men, uh, whether it's men on purpose or something else, I probably would say yes, because uh, Spirit guiding me actually has allowed me to be sitting here having this conversation with you right now. And also allowed my son to be able to make his rite of passage and, um, you know, step into his sovereignty and step into his well-being. And he's really well now, just to be clear, to underscore that he's really well that's that's what we all want to hear most yeah. importantly that that he's doing fine uh you mentioned with the men on purpose podcast it was a great for lack of word cleansing healing it's and healing. healing for you did you learn anything about men that you did not know before you started that journey yes <laughs> they're sensitive and they're people they're people too they're like they're not aliens. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, they're not aliens and they are sensitive. And uh, so here's the other thing that happened with men on purpose because when I uh, got the clarity that I had been the single unifying thread in all of these abusive circumstances, I realized that my vision was on, you know, being prepared to you know fend off attack right yeah. being like i was always on the alert and always like looking for the danger right i was looking for the danger because that was what i experienced you know and what ended up happening for me was as soon as i made the decision to do the men on purpose podcast my vision had to shift to look for men on purpose. Yes. Like, like literally I took the focus off the abusers, moved the focus onto men on purpose. And I was delightfully surprised to find that they're in the world. Yes. <laughs> you know, and, and so that was a big piece of that process as well. Nice. So how did wickedly smart women come into being? Um, in, in the spring of 2019, you know, it was in the spring stuff starts to come. Right? Yeah, they, you, this January thing. Yeah. This January thing. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So the idea came in January, February timeframe. And then I played around with it for a little bit. And I have a, a colleague that she and I have spent the last four years in a strategic alliance with one another, where we met each with you every month and we either dove in and did some deep healing work or we dove in and we did some deep work about our businesses or usually it was a combination of both like i like to say to uh, anybody who's thinking about working with me that i bring spiritual technologies and practical strategies together in a divine union and so if i'm, I'm working with a client or in this case it was street strategic alliance i'm going to bring every bit of 
what I have to the table, the intention is. So she and I were working together and we were going through some stuff and, and all of a sudden this idea came for Wicked the Smart Women and and uh, and then I said, I was a little reluctant actually. I have to tell you, I was a little reluctant because I had uh, you know just spent a couple of years really working with men and uh, you know wasn't really a hundred percent on board. But then the name came, Wickedly Smart Women. I was like, oh, okay, I can do that. I can do that because I I also believe Doctor Five, and I love that your name is Doctor Five. Whatever we name something is what we are living into or what we are acknowledging in ourselves or what we are intending to elevate, celebrate and spotlight. And so, um, yeah, so when Wickedly Smart Women came in in the spring of 2019, I was a little reluctant and a little resistant, partly because I I was already doing that on purpose, but um, I said yes and started recording in in the midsummer and uh, launched the show September of 2019 and within four days we were uh, ranked at number 75 and uh, actually number 25 in Switzerland or Sweden or somewhere um so we ranked within within four days of, of launching wow. the show and so now it has a momentum of its own and it's a movement that I'm here to hold the vision for and allow it to organically grow in a way that uh, I'm not I'm not to be a control freak on it. <laughs> That's the guidance from the upstairs teams like keep your hands off of the wheel on this. We've got yeah. it and just show up and, and be uh, the talent. Right. Because nice. That's what we're here to do. Was it any different starting up men on purpose versus wickedly smart women? Oh, it was exponentially easier starting up with the Smart Woman because I already had the system in place. In fact, I help people. I don't put this front, you know, it's not a front front door thing. I actually help people start podcasts um, if it's if it seems like it's a fit. A lot of people want to start a podcast and they don't have all the other structures that we've already talked about in place. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they put the cart before the horse. Um, so I actually have a, a program that I offer people um, called Start a Podcast Now which you can find out about at startapodcastnow.com. But again, it's not a face front thing in my business. It's really more of a selected thing. And so I help people to start podcasts in a way that allows them to, um, in a way that allow them to have all of these things that we've talked about, you know, kind of in the form of their thinking. Mm -hmm. And then I supply them with my team and I supply them with my signature system for, for podcasting. Uh, in a way that's prosperous. Nice. Uh, the name, The Wealthy Life Mentor, how did that come about? Yeah, so that came about right around the same time that I was getting ready to launch Smart Women. And it was distilled out of a body of work that I had started, uh, you know, kind of just getting the glimpses of back in 2016, right before that uh, rite of passage happened where I became clear about the five ways that we ward off wealth and some ways that we can welcome it instead. And so the Wealthy Life Mentor and the Wealthy Life Method is actually an original body of work that's been um, emerging since 2016 that I've been putting out there and um, presenting. And uh, I like to call the wealthy life, I, I like to define a wealthy life in a way that's a little bit different. A lot of people hear the word wealth and they immediately just think the money part. But for me, wealth is the sum total of all of the resources that we have available to us. Mm. And I like to use the mnemonic device um, thief. I, I like to use the, the word thief, which is interesting, right, to talk about those those resources. So we have time, time is number one. We have our health. That's number two. We have our intellect or imagination or intuition. You know, imagination is kind of a combination of both your intellect and your intuition. So we have our imagination. Then we have energy exchange and energy exchange is the money part. It's like 20% of this equation. And then mm -hmm. we have fun with our friends family and fellow travelers on the journey. And when we have a wealthy life by design, and I help people through using my wealthy life method to get there, when we have a wealthy life by design, we're not stealing from any of these areas. 
Most people are sick from one or more of these areas. And that is what causes them to be in struggle. And it's because they don't recognize that a wealthy life is actually way more than just the money. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree because I say to myself, money, for me, money funds the mission. It's not the mission. Yeah, exactly right. So I I, I, I appreciate your verification on that. Um, what do you feel is the biggest challenge you see people serve or face who are called to serve a particular purpose or mission that requires them to step into the role of entrepreneur? Yeah, well, we talked a little bit about this at the beginning, and, and part of it is they don't know what they don't know, right? So when let me just tell a story. When I first got into the entrepreneurial online space, I had left behind the real estate industry, um, had had my spiritual awakening, had uh, opened up an art gallery and healing arts center because I took a course from somebody who told me I needed a platform. I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. I had no idea what they were talking about. So my idea was a plat of a platform was to um, to start my own art gallery and healing arts center. So so here's like a sidebar. If somebody says something and you don't understand what the hell they're talking about, yep. ask. Raise your hand and ask. Don't make assumptions. I didn't understand what she was talking about. Truthfully, I didn't know that she meant an online presence, right? Mm -hmm. She had used the words online presence because sometimes what happens is, is when you're in an industry and you're speaking to somebody who's outside the industry and yes. you're using industry jargon, they they can make assumptions that you know they wouldn't normally make if if you spoke to them in a language that they can understand. So when she I needed a form in 2003, I was like, okay. I'll start an art gallery. <laughs> and so I started an art, and then art gallery, my platform for two years. Um, then I had, I, I did a street festival two years in a row, uh, which brought 6,500 people to my downtown. It was called Firefest, a celebration of the visual performing culinary and healing arts. Wow. And uh, yeah, so the first year we had 40 vendor booths and 15 live performances on two stages and the mayor gave me everything and it was like a vision and I just followed the guidance and the whole thing came together like butter on hot toast. And here's here's a little key. The second year, people lobbied me to do it. It wasn't a vision. It wasn't something that came from me that I was like, oh my God, I have to do this again. People lobbied me to do it because it was so successful the first year. So I said, yes, I probably should have said no. <laughs> <laughs> and in the second year, cause you know, a uh, uh, for achiever in the second year, I had 80 vendor booths, 35 live performances on three stages. And the, the new mayor fought me every step of the way. The first time, the old mayor was like super generous. The, the new mayor yeah. was not generous at all. So anyway, I never will do a street festival again unless the guy upstairs team says to do one. <laughs> uh, and, and then I came into the office and I came into the speaking space and I, you know, I didn't know what I didn't know. I started by setting up a website. I decided I needed to learn HTML, taught myself HTML right back in 2007 or whatever time frame. So if there's anything that I say to people who are called, you want to get somebody to serve and support and partner you as a mentor, a consultant, a trusted guy, whatever you want to call them, who is where you would like to be. So in my case, I'm very heavily weighted in my business to my lifestyle being served. Because if I'm here to be the messenger, I must be thriving. I must be fed by spending time in nature. I must be fed by spending time creating art. I must be fed so that I'm full, overflowing, and I can be from my cup. And I know how to do math super important. A lot of people come into this, this field because they're called, but they don't do the math. They don't recognize that they actually have to become what I call an accidental entrepreneur. I became an accidental entrepreneur. 
when I was in the real estate business, I was in a partnership and I kind of leaned on my partners to understand a lot of the pieces of it that I didn't understand. I brought a piece to the table. They each brought a piece to the table. But when you step in solo entrepreneurship, you are literally the one in charge of making sure you have supplies. You're the one in charge of making sure that the marketing is working. You're the one in charge of making sure that the service delivery is happening. You're the one in charge of making sure that the sales are happening. You know, like you, you have the whole enchilada on the, on the table. And a lot of times we just want to do the fun things or we put ourselves in the rabbit hole of the shiny object that we buy way too soon in the, in the journey, in the entrepreneurial journey. And so by hiring somebody who has gone the path, it's kind of like you go to Mount Everest, right? If you're going to Mount Everest, you can climb to the top of Mount Everest all by yourself if you'd like to. The likelihood of you getting up there without dying is pretty low yeah. or you can hire Sherpa, right? And and the Sherpa is going to help you the crevasses and the canyon of lost voices and all, you know, the, the fog of confusion that can um, descend on you when you are overwhelmed by the calling and the complexity that you can create for yourself in your business if you don't have somebody who can come in and be incisive and say, no, you know, you don't want to be doing that right now or, you know, you need to take this step and focus on this step for the next 90 days. And then let's see what happened. You know, a lot of people don't recognize that entrepreneurship is a big fat experiment. Mm. Man, the time is running so quickly. So I'm going to try to get in some quick things here. Unfortunately, you, you, you're you just dropping knowledge bombs all over the place. And uh, I know that uh, I'm going to pray. I'm going to leave it to the spirit that we can do a part two, but I'm going to work on what, what I got right now. Part one. I want to ask you what specifically are the five ways that many people ward off wealth? Great. So um, I am going to invite people. You can see that Dr. Vibe has put on the screen, the wealthy life quiz, uh, and it's the wealthy life readiness quiz. So when you take the Wealthy Life Readiness Quiz, you will get a score for that. And then you'll have an opportunity if you decide that you'd like to go ahead to get my Welcoming Wealth mini course, uh, which is all investment. So what I teach in the mini course are the five ways that we ward off wealth, as well as the five ways that we welcome wealth. So to just quickly go through the ways that we ward off wealth, the first one is worry. Worry, when I'm working with somebody, I can see I'm psychic. When I'm working with somebody who's worrying, Worry looks like a dark, gray, musty smelling old army blanket that's wrapped around whatever you're worried about. So if you're worried about money, that's what's going on. And money is going to be repelled by that, right? If you're worried about having enough time, time is going to be, you know, compressed as a result of that. So worry is number one. Number two is waffling. So waffling is unable to make a decision. And what that looks like is, let's say that you are um, at a live event, because someday we're going to have live events again, right? Let's yes. say you're at a live event and you're sitting in the audience. The person on stage has something that they care with you, that they can support you in your entrepreneurship. And it's a $10,000 offer. And you're like, oh my God, really use this. I think that this is the right person to work with. I'm feeling really resonant. This is exactly where I want to go with my business. And then you go off to the ladies room or the men's room and you get a text from your best friend and they, hey, you know that Mediterranean cruise that we've been looking at for the last six years? It's on sale right now for $10,000. And now you have entrepreneurship, cruise ship, entrepreneurship, cruise ship, entrepreneurship, cruise ship. And you don't make a decision in your direction and both ships sail. So waffle is being unable to make a decision. Um, the third one is withdrawing. So let's say you've been here at this, uh, at this event that we're putting on right now, this virtual event, and something sparked in you and you're feeling incredibly resonant with uh, either working with me or Dr. Va or suing some of the things that we've been talking about and then you're like energized and you're on fire and you're like oh my god i've got to do this and then all of a sudden you step away from the computer or you leave the event or whatever it is and you pull your energy back and you withdraw your inspiration and you withdraw your willingness 
to be experimental and your willingness to try something new and your willingness to take action. Well, if you do that, you're not going to create a wealthy life because the universe needs you to be collaborating, right? Yeah. And so if, if you've been put, have somebody put in front of you that can possibly help you or some idea put in front of you that feels resonant to pursue, you've got to take the, the step towards that rather than pulling away from it. Okay. So we've done worry. We've done waffling. We've done withdrawing. Uh, the fourth one is, um, let me think. <laughs> I have to think about this. The okay. fourth one is waiting on. So are we waiting on our handsome prince to come along and rescue us from our trauma or our drama? Or are we running around waiting on everyone else, like taking care of everyone else's business instead of taking care of our own business? And if we're waiting on either somebody to come rescue us or we are being the rescuer, kind of the, the one who is um, you know, tending to everyone else without tending to our own business, then we're not we're going to be warding off wealth as well. And I have to, to refresh my mouth. Oh, whining. Whining's the last <laughs> one. Whining's the last one. Whining. And whining, we often whine over wine. We are or or belly yes. ache over beer. Yes. yes. Sometimes if it's the guys, they're belly yeah. aching over beer, right? So whining over wine. I like to use the five W's because it helps me to remember, but it could be belly aching over beer. And so what happens when we're whining over wine is two things. Whoops. Let me fix my camera. There we go. What happens no when we're whining over wine is two things. Uh, one is when we're whining over wine in a group of other people. And if we're putting our complaints into that group of other people and they are then feeding their energy and their attention and their time and their life force into our complaint, we are now amplifying our complaint rather than our celebration. And when we're doing it over wine, wine or any kind of alcoholic beverage actually lowers your vibration. And so it's like a double whammy to be whining over wine. Those are the five ways we word off well. Okay, wonderful. Uh, geez, so much to cover, so little time. So I'm going to pull this out. So let me say this then. Um, why should someone seek to get wired for wealth? And what happens when they start to convert their calling into cash flow? Yeah, so... Um, this is actually a much longer conversation. Yes. I, so. I think we need to be complete with today. And yes. so how we are wired up for wealth, uh, just to, to tie a bow on it, yes. when we are wired up for wealth, we know when to set boundaries. So I'm going to set a boundary and say, if you are interested in finding out more about becoming wired up for wealth, then either take the wealth readiness quiz or reach out to me at my website, thewealthylifementor.com, and apply for consultation with me. And then, of course, you can also uh, listen in to my beautiful uh, podcast, Wickedly Smart Women, to learn from myself as well as all the amazing women that I spotlight and highlight and celebrate. So I'm going to set a boundary and say, no, we're not going there. <laughs> no, we're not going there. Hopefully there'll be a part two. Uh, before we let you go, uh, any words of wisdom from your spirit? Because yeah. most of the time I'd say to friends who come on, you have any fun words, but I would like to say to you, are anything from your spirit that you'd yes, like to so share with the audience? So what's coming in is I'm seeing the, uh, the owl. And the owl, my dad uh, is connected to the owl. And so the owl, there's two things. My dad used to say, uh, he used to have a little saying that he would say, and that was, the wise old owl sat in the oak. The more he saw, the less he spoke. The less he spoke, the more he heard. Why can't you be like that wise old bird? So that's one piece that wants to come in. And the other piece is, to start asking, instead of asking, how can I do this? Start asking, who, who, who can help me? I love it. I love that. Angel, thank you for uh, 
continuously adding light to myself mm-hmm. and um, n- showing how important when it's taken right, what the spirit can do for oneself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When right. it's done right. I, I, I really, really appreciate you. I appreciate your son. Uh, I'm speaking it one day. I'd actually, I'm going to put it out there spirit wise. I would love to have you and your son together on this platform, sharing some of your story and journey, because it would be so impactful because I do a lot of helping of men. And also there's a lot of ladies out there that are raising boys on their own and your victory story with your son. I mean, that would be so impactful. Well, we will let the spirit guide. Yeah, I'll let the spirit, but I, I just feel that because that's really, like I said, after you shared that story, I said I could stop right here. Yeah. But I, I appreciate you being um, open because I don't like to say vulnerability because I hear that word too much. Just open mm-hmm. and just to share with us personally, business-wise, and uh, I really appreciate you and your son and everything you have done are doing and will be doing. And you always have a home here. And as I said, if there's anything I can help you with, please don't be afraid to ask. Thank you so much, Dr. Bob. It has been my absolute pleasure to be here with you today. I really appreciate you and all you're doing because the world needs more beauty and the world needs more men on purpose. Yes. You actually exemplify both. You are a beautiful soul. And you are clearly on purpose. So thank you so much for hosting me. I appreciate your platform. <laughs> it's our platform. You're giving me the platform. It, it, it's, it's our platform because, yeah. hey, we're podcasters. You, we can't do it by ourselves. And if we did, we'd be burnt out. That's true. That's so true. thank you so much. Everyone, I am Dr. Vibe, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show, the home of Epic Conversations. I'm the host of Epic Conversations, 2020 Podcast News and 2018 Innovation Award given out by the Canadian Ethnic Media Association. Also, once a month, I host the only online broadcast in the world for Dads and Fathers that is sponsored by Dove Men Care. It's also co-sponsored by Dad Central Canada's National Fatherhood Organization. I'd like to thank Shirley and Ahmed, who caught some of this live, and there's some other people. If I don't name you, it's because of my head, not my heart. I always like to end off with this. Live your life as a dream. If you can dream it, you can make it. Sometimes you have to get smaller to get stronger. Block assumptions, and then aim bigger, aim better, aim higher, aim wider. Love, faith, and respect. And especially during these times, give yourself grace. God bless. Peace to all. Keep the faith. And thank you for watching. It's appreciated not taking for granted. Goodbye, everybody.